I hear the quiet of the room. So good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, for those of you looking for coffee and bagels, I can assure you the Panera is arriving soon. Uh, one of our great chief residents, Aaron Dyer, physically drove to Panera to pick up the order. So everybody thank Aaron when it comes truly above and beyond. Um, so it will be coming soon. She said she had acquired the goods at 7.55. So if that gives you a time by time update. Um, so this morning we have a fantastic Grand Rounds presentation by Dr. Kachi on a great topic that I know is really relevant uh, to us who rotate on inpatient and in our outpatient clinics. Um, so just some brief background on Dr. Kachi. He went to medical school and residency here uh, before leaving us, unfortunately, for cardiology fellowship at New York Presbyterian Cornell. He then worked in Pittsburgh for a while at Allegheny Medical or General Hospital before he ultimately made his way back to Wash U, uh, where he is a assistant professor of medicine in the division of cardiology. So let's welcome Dr. Kachi. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, welcome to the Grand Rounds. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, for me, it's a special honor to be here. Um, as a medical student, as a resident, I learned so much through Grand Rounds and CPC, are my favorite uh, conferences. And to be back here to give back, so to speak, is, is really an honor. So thank you for having me. Today we'll talk about corner CTA, something that I'm really passionate about. So if my speech gets pressured and fast, it's because I'm really excited about it. And there's a lot of slides to cover. Um, but we'll talk about how this is a tool that I think is the one tool that can identify disease, ischemia, and lesion risk, specific risk, very, very well. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about specifically as an outline where we are now um, with chest pain evaluation and where it's CT plays in that role, why I think this, this area of imaging is growing, and where I think we're going next. Um, this is the obligatory epidemiology slide um, for coronary disease. It's still a problem. It's still the number one killer. It's a leading cause of death for men, women, people of multiple racial and ethnic groups. Uh, one person dies every 33 seconds from cardiovascular disease. One in 20 patients above the age of 20 have coronary disease. And about a million people have a heart attack. There's a heart attack every 40 seconds. So by the time this slide, this presentation's over, there'll be an increasing number of uh, heart attacks. Hopefully not in this room. Um, the cost of the system is also astronomical, 239 billion each year from 2018 to 2019. And this is, this is the first page on the CDC website when you look up coronary disease. Um, so what we'll talk about is what is our role as physicians and providers when we take care of patients? Ultimately, I want to impress upon you, this is what I want you to think about anytime you see a patient that has coronary disease or chest pain. Um, what we're talking about is placing the patient on the spectrum of atherosclerosis from either no disease to very severe disease um, and focusing our prevention strategies at halting these events. And so how do we do that right now? What's the current paradigm? Uh, the clinical evaluation is depicted here, whether they're symptomatic or not, we take into account their risk factors like smoking, recent infections, alcohol use, what's their diet like, what's their genetic background, what's their family tree. We integrate that in our mind when we speak to patients and we think about what could we order, what could we do to enhance our ass assessment of their risk, what physical exam features will help me assess their risk, do they have a murmur, is their pain reproducible on exam? Are there biomarkers that I can think about, whether it's troponins, anti pro BNPs, or genetic markers that will make me better understand their overall cardiovascular risk? And then most simply, you can't walk out of a cardiology clinic without getting an EKG at least once. And how does that speak to their overall risk? And then you place them in your mind, either low, intermediate, or high risk. And based on that risk assessment, you can either decide to do a functional test, a stress test, or if they're intermediate or high risk, you may even consider sending them directly to the cath lab. And before we get there, I just want to touch on the ASCVD pool cohort equation. This is a significant step up from the Framingham risk calculator that we used to have traditionally. Um, this is because this cohort equation incorporates more African Americans and other races, more women, includes stroke and TIA as an outcome measure for, as defined at ASCV, as an ASCVD event. And it does a much better job in, 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 compared to older um, risk calculators in assessing risk. However, it still underestimates risk in patients that are American Indians, South Asians, Puerto Ricans, and it overestimates it East Asians, Mexican Americans, and obese patients. So it's not perfect. So if you want to further risk stratify and understand your patient's risk, you, can, you have one of two options. So one of the most common questions when I'm on firm, how do we decide what kind of stress tests to get? How do we think about the patient? Um, and maybe we'll go through that a little bit. There's two major options. You can either exercise them on a treadmill or you can give them a medication um, vasodilator challenge. 
And for an extra stress test, very simply, you put them on a treadmill, you hook them up to an EKG, and you see how long they go, which has significant prognostic information, and what happens to their EKG as a uh, sensitive marker for ischemia. If you are interested and want to get additional imaging, you can echo them before and after their exercise and see if there's differences in wall motion abnormalities that could suggest the presence of coronary disease. You can do this either with medication stress or exercise stress. Additionally, if you want to get even more advanced with advanced imaging, you can give them a vasodilator uh, medication, such as regadenosine, and image their uh, heart before and after that, that stress challenge. And also with MRI, with stress perfusion MRI, you can also give them gadolinium and identify any um, scar uh, that may hone in on your overall cardiac risk and their diagnosis. Uh, and on the nuclear end, you can give them technetium-99 with SPECT or rubidium or ammonia in PET and get an assessment of ischemic lesions and identify where they are on this atherosclerotic cascade. A, a positive test in any of these modalities that I've just outlined would give you an idea that the patient probably is on the right hand of the screen here. A negative test most likely suggests and correlates with patients who have less disease or non-ischemic disease. By contrast, coronary CT and geography can more directly and comprehensively address our coronary questions. Uh, before we delve into how coronary CTA um, can give us this information, let's just do a quick basic review of how a CT scan works and how we generate the images and the data that we'll spend the rest of the hour tackling. A CT scanner is comprised of an X-ray tube and a detector. Um, a series of two-dimensional uh, cross-sectional images are stacked together to create a 3D uh, model of the structures of interest. In this particular case, we're imaging the heart and the coronaries. There are typically two parts to every coronary CTA that you order. The first one is a non-contrast sequence to obtain a coronary calcium score. And the second part is a contrasted angiography sequence that outlines the coronary arteries. And we'll go through each of those parts together. Um, the coronary calcium score is very important, at least in my world, in the preventive space, and I'm sure in, in your world, when you guys see patients for the first time and you're assessing their risk, a coronary calcium score is also advantageous for patients who can't tolerate um, iodinated contrast. And this is the representative image of a coronary calcium score, and you can see that the LAD territory and a little bit of the circumflex have some calcium. And so what does this mean? Um, what do we do with this information? When we calculate the calcium score, we know from the MESA study, which is one of the largest prospective observational um, uh, studies looking at a North American population with, uh, that's well represented in multiple ethnicities and races and geographically in the country, uh, where they got both serum and imaging biomarkers serially over time and tracked how those markers correlated to events. What we've learned is that ultimately in the top uh, figure in the middle of the screen, you can see that mortality is dictated and stratified best by how much plaque you already have. So you can be 75 to 84 years old with a CAC score of zero and still have less risk than a 45 to 54 year old who has a CAC score greater than 100. Um, just let that sink in for a second. Think about all the 85 year olds that you see and how different their risk is just based on the calcium score stratification. The same holds true if you stratify by risk factor burden. So a patient that has three traditional risk factors like obesity, diabetes, or smoking, can still have less cardiovascular risk of mortality with a calcium score of zero compared to someone who has no traditional risk factors and has a calcium score greater than 100, depicted on the bottom middle figure. And so if you take the ASCVD pool cord equation buckets that we typically assign patients to, and you only look at intermediate or high risk, and then you further stratify those patients that fall into those uh, buckets by calcium score zero, one to 100, or greater than 100, you can see that in the left-hand side of the, uh, of the last figure on the right, the calcium score further stratifies their risk and de-risks a significant portion of those patients. A couple of takeaways here is that the observed ASAVD rates compared to the pro pro projected ASAVD rates based on those buckets is discordant. I think the observed ASAVD rates for the MESA study were always lower than the calculated risk. And to be more precise in our risk assessment, calcium score can be extremely helpful in identifying patients who are truly at risk or at, at lower risk than their predicted values. So as I said, every coronary CTA that you order will get a calcium score, so you'll have this information at your disposal. But I'd highlight that a positive calcium score really gives you atherosclerosis at the end of atherogenesis, and a negative calcium score really doesn't tell you anything about what's going on before that the plaque is calcified. Um, and so how prevalent is this? One of the most common questions I get is, well, what's the likelihood that I have non-calcified plaque if I have a calcium score of zero? There have been multiple studies in different parts of the world, in East Asia, Europe, as well now in, um, in, in the US, led by Karam Nasir. This is the Miami Heart Study, looking at asymptomatic patients, all comers, um, 
2,000, 2000 individuals in the Mi greater Miami area, aged about 53. Half of them were women, half of them were Hispanic or Latino, the other half were, were white and African American. And they looked at the, they all got coronary CTAs, calcium scores and a coronary angiogram. And they looked at only patients that had a calcium score of zero. And you can see that 16% of patients still had plaque, even though they had a calcium score of zero. And the highest subgroup that had that were men at 22.9%. So one in five patients can have some degree of plaque, even if their calcium score is zero. And that's been reproduced in different cohorts. And that number changes from 5 to 15%, de depending on the pretest probability and the population you're studying. So moving on to the next part of the CT scan is the contrasted uh, portion of the CT scan. This is where we inject iodinated contrast with the hope of better outlining the coronary arteries and identifying plaque characteristics and exactly where um, the coronaries, um, um, where the risk lies within the coronaries. Uh, and so when you order this test, um, one of the frustrations from the ordering side, and one of the areas of confusion when I'm on firm is um, which patients are eligible for coronary CT and which ones are not. One of the biggest reasons why we turn patients away or we discourage a coronary CT, which I don't like to do, but when we do it, it's because of poor heart rate control. And why is this so important? Um, well, the heart's a moving structure. And in order to image a moving structure, you have to make sure that you have a fast enough scanner that can capture Im still images um, that can be diagnostic. And so what we do to, to address this issue is that we gate it to the, ECG, the, the EKG. There's two points in the cardiac cycle in the R interval where the relative motion of coronary segments is, relative, is, is at its lowest uh, along the majority of segments, and that's in diastole, around 60 to 70% of the R interval. You can see in that figure in the top left that if you model the velocities of each of the coronary segments from uh, 14 different segments, the lowest velocity and the, and the most consistent velocity is at that point in diastole. There's a second period in end systole where there's relatively low motion, which we, always, which we always consider imaging as well if the patient's significantly tachycardic. Um, for our traditional single source CT scanners with shallow Z axis coverage and limited temporal resolution, as depicted here, um, acceptable heart rates can be less than 70 beats per minute. And here's an illustration uh, illustrating that point that that ideal period of motion free period in diastole has a um, 350 millisecond duration. And if you increase your heart rate up to 72 beats per minute, that diastolic period goes down to 128 milliseconds right at the border of the lower end of the spatial resolution, the temporal resolution for a, for a single source CT scanner. This is why we harp on heart rate control and optimization of our, of our scans. However, we now have dual source scanners and we're lucky enough here at the Mallinckrodt to have a, a number of these and excellent equipment. Um, and with dual source scanners, your temporal resolution can go down to 66 milliseconds, so improving by a factor of two. So now we can tolerate higher heart rates and image patients who, are, who have heart rates from 80 to 100 and we can toggle over to the systolic period which is less sensitive to heart rate than the diastolic period. Meaning the higher your heart rate gets, that end systolic period stays at about 125 milliseconds, and our modern scanners can handle that really, really well. And so with that, we can make images like this. We can give you a, a, a beautiful um, outline of the coronary tree from the left main to the distal LAD or any of the side branches. And I can tell you with certainty, or with more certainty, um, whether they have no CAD, minimal, mild, moderate, or severe coronary disease. And I can tell you if it's calcified or non-calcified, and I can characterize the plaque along each of those arterial beds. And not only that, we can stack the 2D images and make 3D representations of these. And because CT, uh, the CT technology has isotropic resolution, we can define plaque and define the structures in, in X, Y, and Z axes. And in so doing, we can identify patients across the entire spectrum of atherosclerosis. And why is that important? Well, here we can see the annual mortality risk from pooled data from medical therapy control arms from various prospective randomized trials comparing optimal medical therapy to revascularization. And while it's not surprising that the extent of CAD from single vessel disease, two vessel disease, to triple vessel disease is correlated with worsening mortality, we know that the story of the events that drive this mortality is far more interesting. Uh, here I show that serial angiography data dating back to the 80s and 90s taught us that the majority of culprit lesions at the time of ACS involved precursor lesions that previously harbored plaque that was less than 70% stenotic. You know, our, our, our inclination is to focus on the most obstructive lesions when we're assessing patients, but the, the lesions that are causing events are the ones that were non-obstructive in the past. And this has been replicated again and again from the 80s and 90s to more modern contemporary imaging studies involving CT as well. And this isn't just for ACS patients. This is also true for sudden cardiac death patients. This, um, this is a representation of 
This figure is a representation of a study looking at 50 consecutive patients who came in with coronary sudden cardiac death. And what they did was that at autopsy, cross-sectional pathologic specimens were analyzed, and a, a, an estimate of their percent stenosis or plaque burden was, was conducted by um, pathologists and showed that the precursor lesions or the culprit lesions where there was thrombus harbored plaque that was less than 70% steno stenotic in the majority of patients. And so while traditional practice patterns define primary and secondary prevention around an ASCVD event as depicted here, I'd argue that we ought to focus on preventing plaque from, from uh, starting from the start. And so a new proposed method of prevention should focus on primary prevention before plaque is, has formed and preventing that plaque from progressing as secondary prevention. And moving that timeline to the left will maybe help us reduce events and, and improve our patients' mortality rates. So this is exactly where CCTA will shine. Um, and I'll show you very briefly how coronary CT angiography can help you confidently rule out disease, how we can identify early inflamed coronary plaque by assessing the perivascular fat attenuation signature from each vessel. Uh, we'll also talk about how we can identify soft or rupture-prone plaque with CT angiography before it becomes obstructive and before it has ruptured to cause an ACVD event. We'll also talk about when the patient presents to the emergency department with chest pain, how, how can we use CCTA to better refine who needs further intervention, who does not. And lastly, we'll talk about how uh, CCTA has allowed, advances in CCTA have allowed us to model ischemia and different types of stress along the plaque that can predict which plaques are, will rupture and which ones will not. We'll start by identifying how CCTA can rule out disease by sharing with you a case of a patient I took care of recently. It was a 56-year-old woman with dyslipidemia, prediabetes, um, hypertension, obesity, who presented to me for evaluation of dyspnea on exertion. I went ahead and ordered a CCTA because of all the reasons I've already sort of touched on with you. And I can sh show you here, here's the LAD, here's the RCA, and here's the circumflex. And to the interventionally inclined in the room, uh, we can take a cursor and walk down each of these arteries and give you a cross-sectional view that mimics IVIS and OCT for every segment of the, of the vessels that are imaged in the screen. And so not only can we ide uh, identify plaque, if we do, we can characterize it in a three-dimensional ma manner that's very, very helpful for our colleagues. Um, and just to note here, this patient also has a calcium score of zero. So I, I get to arm her with that information as she's making decisions about her per cardiac prevention therapies. Now, with respect to, with respect to her symptoms, I can also now be confident that it's not coming from coronary ischemia. She does not need stress testing. She does not need any other further cardiac tests to make me rule out coronary disease because I have done that very confidently here. And I'm, I can lean on that very aggressively in the, in the patient's room because there's a plethora of data going back two decades showing that the negative predictive value is anywhere between 90 to 99% for a negative CT scan. And this is with all traditional scanners that are not as good as the ones that we have today. And also, this, the 90 to 99% variance is explained by how they define coronary injury sorry, coronary disease by coronary angiography. That's why I want to stop and just talk about what's con been considered the gold standard in these studies is coronary angiography. There are limitations to coronary angiography, even though it's a great imaging modality and a, and a tool for us to image small vessels that are anywhere between two and four millimeters in size. The spatial resolution of a cath is less than 0.2 millimeters, which is excellent for imaging small structures. The temporal resolution is excellent at 33 milliseconds, as opposed to traditional CT scanners that had a spatial resolution of 0.4, and as I told you, uh, a temporal resolution anywhere between 60 to 120. Our new force scanners that we have available at the Mallinckrodt um, are dual source, have a spatial resolution of 0.24, and a great temporal resolution to make these images. And the other big point I want to make about coronary geography considered as a gold standard is that, yes, it's great for all the reasons I just mentioned, but what is projected in a, a 2D image representation of a 3D structure can be extremely misleading. What looks one way in one image can look completely different in another one and can drastically change our interpretation. And you don't get that problem with coronary CT because, as I mentioned, you get isotropic resolution. If something looks funny one way, you can spin it around and really identify exactly what's going on. Here's a, a, a representative image from the um, accuracy study looking at coronary angiography study with QCA, which is quantitative coronary angiography in the top left, the same vessel on panel B, and a uh, straightened multiplanar reconstruction in panel C. Um, and you can see that there's a good correlation here between uh, coronary angiography and CT. How about identifying patients who have plaque, when they ha or even before they have plaque? How about identifying inflammation? As we know from multiple grand round stocks that we've had over the years, that it's not just atherosclerosis that's the problem. There's also inflammation that drives atherosclerosis that we need to identify to help reduce the risk for our patients. And how, how can CT do that? Well, 
The, if you look at the tissue immediately surrounding the coronary vessel, you have adipose tissue. And this is called perivascular adipose tissue. And if you look at the attenuation markers that are present in the adipose tissue surrounding a, a, a vessel that's at risk, you'll see that the lipid content goes down relative to the water content in vessels that are highly inflamed. You can also get markers of higher attenuation in, 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 in areas of vessels that have a lot of fibrosis and a lot of inflammatory um, mediators. And so by taking advantage of that natural process from the histology lab to the imaging lab, we can scale our assessment of that, of that perivascular fat tissue as depicted on the right here. And there's um, a couple of uh, uh, papers and um, um, lab groups that are looking at this and looking at patients with, and scoring the entire attenuation map around a vessel and creating what's called a fat attenuation index and scoring that against patients that are matched for their age and gender and creating what's called an FAI score. And if you score really highly on a, on a CTA segment um, for a particular uh, uh, patient, that, uh, that vessel is deemed to be more inflamed than someone who scores at, at the mean or lower. And here is depicted a, a patient that had an FAI score that was elevated at rest, a, a, a baseline, I'm sorry, and then underwent therapy with 40 milligrams of statin and had a repeat scan in a year. And you can see that their FAI score went down uh, substantially. And this is, some, this is a way in which CCTA can be used to track the presence of inflammation and responses to therapy. And these, um, what I have not shown you here is that these FAI scores also correlate with overall MACE and cardiovascular risk. What about coronary CTA for the purposes of identifying soft plaque that may not be inflamed or may be inflamed, but also has characteristic features within the plaque that are more likely to rupture than others? What we've learned um, will be illustrated in this case, uh, another case of a patient that I took care of, who's a 49-year-old woman, hypertension, dyslipidemia. She has intermittent left-sided chest pains that improve in nitroglycerin. But she was seen by her PCP and her LDL was not terrible, and she had a nuclear spec exam that was deemed to be normal. So I said, okay, she has a normal prior um, functional test. She clearly has symptoms, she has risk factors. I really wanna know what's going on. Let's get a coronary CTA. And you can see here, on first glance, her calcium score is zero. So my initial impression is, oh, maybe, maybe there's not much to, to think about here from a coronary side. But for the astute reader, you'll see that in the RCA, there is some soft plaque. And if we zoom in a little bit on that soft plaque, there's more that we can say here. Um, it looks uh, non-calcified, it looks relatively dark, and we call that low attenuation. And we can actually map that. We can take software on a CT data set and apply um, an analysis tool that will grade different attenuation zones in different colors. And so low attenuation is defined as less than 30 household units, and that's depicted as red. And intermediate is 30 to 130, which is depicted as blue, and calcified plaque is depi depicted as yellow. And what you can see here is that this patient has mixed plaque with a low attenuation signature as well, which portends high risk. Um, and this has been validated across many CT studies. These are the four high-risk phenotypes for plaque on a CT image. You can get positive remodeling, which is defined as, a, as an outer vessel diameter dilation at the area of plaque that's 10% greater than the surrounding reference vessel. You can get spotty calcification, which is defined as a focal calcification less than three millimeters in, 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 in diameter. Uh, you can get low attenuation plaque, as I just showed you from my case, uh, an area of plaque that has a necrotic fatty core that measures out to be less than 30 household units in its center. Or you can get this characteristic napkin ring sign that has both low attenuation and high attenuation uh, signatures in, within a plaque um, uh, lesion. And why is this important? These are the features that have correlated histologically and pathologically to thin cap fibrous atheromas that are lipid rich, that are prone to rupture in the uh, interventional lab and in the, in, in the histology lab. And I bring up, there are many studies I could have brought up to show uh, that these features correlate with events, but the one I decided to, to show is Romacat 2, and I do that because um, our very own Dr. Pam Wardard was, was very involved in this trial um, and led our involvement here at WashU uh, to, show, to show this data. And what we've seen here from the Romacat 2 study, which was a study looking at patients presenting to the ED that were deemed to be low risk with negative troponins and normal EKGs that were randomized to standard of care or CT first assessment, uh, and to track outcomes of, such as length of stay and, and MACE events at, at 28 days, if you look at the CT subset of this trial and look at the plaque characteristics that correlated with patients within that cohort that actually had a true ACS event, you can see that the presence of these high-risk features in a stepwise fashion increased the relative risk of having a culprit lesion that caused ACS. Um, and that's depicted here with the relative uh, risk ratios presented on the right side of the screen. 
But we can do more with CCTA than just identify patients who are going to be rupturing. We can also follow these plaques. So if I have an outpatient where I identify this plaque, as I did with my case example, I have confidence to know that we can modulate this and we can track it with serial imaging. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, you see a stat naive patient from baseline to follow up in the paradigm study. And you can see, by, by comparison, a patient who's taking a stat, and you can see that the relative non-calcified portion of a plaque goes down and the calcified portion goes up with therapy. And so if we, watch, if we serially follow our patients and we see that high-risk plaque is progressing and worsening in a patient, that can be impactful in how you assess their risk. And you can see how well are they responding to statin therapy, to PCSK9s, or to blood pressure control, and stabilizing their plaque, and making sure that their risk of having a plaque rupture event goes down. You can use CT imaging to, to track that evolution. Next, I'll talk to you quickly about what happens when a patient comes into the ED. Is it safe? Is it effective? Does it delay care? Um, this is a big question that comes up every time you talk about coronary CTA and implementing it in different settings. This, again, is the Romacat 2 study. And the main uh, outcome that they looked at, actually, was length of stay. And you could see that the length of stay was seven hours sh shorter for a CTA first strategy than standard of care. Standard of care in Romacat 2 was a mixture of stress ECG that I showed you, stress echo, and spec perfusion imaging. And you can see that not only was the length of stay shorter, uh, it, there were more rapid, the percent of rapid discharges were higher with the CTA arm, and there was no uh, difference in undetected ACS events and no difference in MACE at 28 days, so it was a safe strategy. There was more downstream testing, but I'll remind you that Romacat 2 occurred in an era where we could not do ischemic testing with the CTA data set. So if someone had an intermediate or significant lesion, often that prompted another functional test. So that, that's what the more downstream testing refers to. And overall cost was very similar between the two groups. This is back 10 years ago. If you look at a contemporary era uh, analysis of the Romacat 2 study looking at high sensitivity troponins, you can see that CCTA and the intermediate risk group meaning patients who have a high sensitivity troponin that's not above the 99th percentile, but it's also not normal. If you use CCTA first, you can further declassify 72% of patients that can be discharged safely. So 72% of patients in the intermediate risk group can be safely discharged, knowing that their ACS events are gonna be low if you have a normal CCTA. The other 28% uh, will end up needing further assessment, potentially depending on what their CCTA shows. And lastly, how can we model ischemia? How can we use, how can we use a CTA data set to model what's happening to these lesions, which ones are functionally significant, which ones are likely causing symptoms, and which ones are gonna to lead to events and which ones are not. And before we get into that, we have to have a basic understanding of what FFR is, which is fractional flow reserve. This is a tool that we use in the cardiac cath lab to assess whether there is a significant pressure drop across a lesion. And there's a lot more math and derivation that I could go into, but for simplicity's sake, during maximum hyperemia, which is induced by vasodilators like adenosine, um, the, the ratio between the distal coronary pressure to the proximal coronary pressure um, is, what, is the tool that we use to assess how much significance is there across that lesion. And the, the reason why we use 0.8 as a cutoff is because if you look at the, um, the, the major cardi cardiovascular events and studies looking at FFR assessment, 0.8 and above has relatively low MACE events, and 0.8 and below has very high MACE events. And so we use 0.8 as a cutoff for FFR to define as um, abnormal. And what we use in our cath lab here at WashU is something called IFR, which is sim has similarities to what I just told you. But the cutoff is 0.9 or 0.89 rather than 0.8. So how do we use coronary CT data sets to, to estimate that and to model that? Um, there's a lot of math and derivation here. But to keep it simple, we take the CT data sets and we use the principles, the allometric scaling laws of, of biology that dictates that the amount of total coronary flow or blood flow to an organ is proportional to the size of that organ. So your brain and your gut and your heart get different amounts of blood flow proportional to their mass. We can derive myocardial mass from a CT data set because we're looking at the myocardium and we can uh, correlate myocardial mass to myocardial volume based on uh, the density of a, of a human t uh, myocardial tissue. So we can get the total coronary flow for a particular organ. We can then model to total coronary resistance knowing that the relationship between pressure and flow and resistance is stated as such. We use the mean brachial pressure of a patient as a surrogate of pressure. And so we can solve for total flow, total resistance. And then we can use what's called the Navier-Stokes equations, which are uh, physical principle uh, equations that dictate what happens to fluid as it goes through different uh, tubes. And we can then model what's happening at each arterial level in terms of flow and pressure. And by doing that, as I just told you about FFR, you can model what's happening distal and proximal to a particular lesion, and you can assign it values that correlate with the cath lab. 
And so how accurate are these modeling assessments of a CT data set? It's been, FRCT has been around for about a decade now, and it's, and it's been uh, rigorously tested in prospective registries and trials comparing to invasive angiography. And to keep it simple, the NXT trial looked at 254 patients that underwent both CT and invasive angiography, and the overall accuracy of, FR, of FFRCT in predicting a lesion that's ischemic on cath lab assessment with FFR was 80%, improved up from just looking at the lesion and looking at the percent stenosis of, of an accuracy of 50%. The specificity goes from 32% to 79%, so it's significantly improved in doing so, just above and beyond looking at just CT stenosis alone. Um, the Pacific trial is also an important one to, to mention. This was from 2016. Um, this looked at 208 patients that all actually underwent SPECT, PET, CT, and CTFFR, and coronary angiography. Um, I haven't seen another a, a trial like this. This is very informative in my practice and how I look at all these, because I, I perform all of these imaging modalities myself, and this gives me a relative um, sort of uh, accuracy between them. And so if you look at how FFRCT performs, you can see that the diagnostic accuracy here is 87% for FFRCT for identifying lesions that were confirmed to be positive in an in invasive lab with FFR compared to 80% with PET, 82% with SPECT, and 79% just by looking at coronary CTA alone. And here's the area under the curve, receiver operator curve for these different modalities. You can see that it's 0.94 for FFRCT um, as opposed to 0.87 with PET and 0.83 with SPECT. And the outcomes that I showed you with the invasive FFR with the FAME study has been reproduced with FFRCT with the NXT long-term outcomes registry and advanced registries, showing that every increment and in, uh, decrease of FFRCT correlates with increased risk of having a MACE event, just like we depicted with, with the FFR data. But it's not all perfect. There are limitations. I just told you this is all modeling. This is all anchored in the fact that you have good quality data. Uh, and so if you have artifacts that, cause, that are uh, driven by calcifications, motion, arrhythmias, then you'll have a poor 3D anatomical model, and you'll have a poor um, a correlation with the invasive FFR group. There's also a number of physiologic assumptions that are made with FFRCT that aren't always specific to your individual patient, that are based on population-specific and patient-specific data that maybe can't be extrapolated perfectly. And there's an assumption that there's no microvascular disease in the FFRCT model. <clears throat> so if you have patients that have significant microvascular dysfunction, you may have FFRCT values that are below the measured values in the, F in the invasive lab. And areas that are stented, <clears throat> or bypass have not yet been validated for FFRCT analysis. So I'll pull it all together with a third case that I have of a third patient that I took care of. He's 51 years old, hypertensive, dyslipidemic, obese, former smoker. He's a driver, and so he needs a yearly a Department of Transportation physical, and he always passes his stress tests. But recently, he's been having dyspnea on exertion. And because of his risk factors, again, I said, let's turn to coronary CT. And uh, needless to say, he had disease in all three vessels, so we'll go through each vessel one at a time, and I'll, t I'll show you how CT correlates with all the other tools that I just mentioned. If you look at the LED here, there's not much calcification, which is kind of great, but if you take a closer look at that proximal lesion, you can see that there's mixed plaque there with the possible spotty calcification, maybe some positive remodeling, so some high-risk features, but very clearly you can see that there's no, it's not obstructive. There's plenty of lumen around that plaque, and if you look at a cross-sectional image, again, as would correlate with, FF, with the IVIS and OCT in the cath lab, you can see what's going on in that plaque at every angle of that plaque. If you, if you send it to heart flow for FRCT analysis, it, it confirms what we already thought. There's not an ischemic nature to this lesion, and you can see that it models FF, uh, an FFR value along any point along that vessel. And if you send it to the cath lab, which we ended up doing, you can see that it correlates with IFR of 0.89, which uh, was, was not significant in this particular case. If you look at the left circumflex, you can see that there's significant disease in the mid-segment, um, and it causes significant uh, obstruction just by visual assessment. You can confirm that with, um, with virtual IVIS uh, created images in the short axis view. And if you send it to FRCT, there's a significant drop from normal proximal to the lesion to significantly abnormal distal to that lesion with a drop of more than 0.2 in the FRCT value. And again, with IFR on the cath lab, this was significantly abnormal. What about the RCA? The RCA has even more going on. It, the, the contrast with pacification abruptly stops. This is classic. This is a classic picture for a CTO, which is a chronic total occlusion. And if you zoom in, you, that's exactly what you see in the short axis view. Again, confirmed. FFRCT analysis confirms that they also model it as a CTO. And when you take them to the cath lab, that's exactly what you see. So when I send this patient, again, they've never, before, before, they, before, before the images on the right hand of the screen, they've never been to the cath lab. So I'm armed with all this information. I can tell Jazz, look, these are the vessels I'm worried about. 
these are the ischemic vessels. Let's have a strategy on how to fix this patient. Patient symptomatic in spite of anti anginal therapy. So I, our strategy was first, let's fix the left circumflex, and this is what he's done. This is the, the beautiful work that he, do, that, that he does that, that on a day-to-day -day basis that we're very proud to have, um, him and everyone else in the cath lab. Uh, and then we said, okay, if the patient still has symptoms, maybe we'll go after that CTO. There's a lot of controversy about opening up chronic total occlusions. This patient had continued symptoms, ischemic symptoms. We sent him back to the cath lab, and we fixed the RCA. And now he's actually doing much better with less anti-anginal therapy and doing well from a, uh, from a clinical standpoint. One last area that I want to touch is that we can do more than just FFRCT with computational fluid dynamics. The Emerald study, which I was able to connect to uh, and, and participate with in my previous uh, institution, is a really elegant study looking at patients that present to your, presented to 11 different centers across the globe with ACS, who happened to have a CT within two months and two years before they came in with ACS. And so we, we looked at the lesions, their precursor lesions that correlated with their ACS culprit lesion on, on the cath lab table, and said, how can we predict, how can we model what's happening with those lesions, and which ones had features that were gonna lead to that rup plaque rupture event, and which ones had, didn't have those features. And what they did with Emerald was go beyond plaque characteristics. They actually looked at different hemodynamics that are uh, negatively prognostic, including shear wall stress and axial plaque stress. And what they showed, here's a representative uh, case of a patient that came in with an LED plaque, that had an LED plaque identified on CT uh, at baseline that had a diameter stenosis of 50%, that had some low attenuation plaque, napkin ring sign, and spotty calcification, and 116 days later, ended up having a culprit uh, ACS event with an MI. And you can see with the computational um, assessment in the middle panel in the top row, even though the FFRCT was modeled as normal, the delta FFRCT was more than 0.8, which was the cutoff that they used as abnormal. Uh, the wall shear stress was elevated, and so was the axial plaque stress. So while the plaque assessment by adverse plaque features did have some risk. The hemodynamics added even more risk. If you look at that same patient and their RCA, the RCA had a plaque that had 33% stenosis, no real adverse plaque features except for spotty calcification, and then had a normal FRCT with all the advanced hemodynamic features that I just described. And that, that RCA did not plaque rupture uh, and, and was stable, at least at that time. And so if you take this analysis and you do that for all the patients that are included in the Emerald trial, you can see that as you add more data to your model, you become better and better discriminating with a C, improving C-index statistic at predicting which plaques are gonna rupture and which ones are not. And if you look at all the culp culprit lesions, half of them had adverse plaque features, and half of them, uh, the same half also had adverse hemodynamic features. And this predicted which, which lesions are gonna rupture and which ones are not in very reliable fashion. And if you rank which CT parameters give you the most information gain uh, from the CT data set, Delta FFRCT was the most helpful, followed by diameter stenosis, followed by the rest that are listed on the slide. So you can rank which ones are most, most valued as you're reading them at the bedside, or at the, at the reading room. And we can go beyond all these pieces of information. So when you get a coronary CT, you're not just looking at the coronaries, you're looking at the heart. You can get LV function analysis. This is a CT data set looking at beautiful images that are, I would argue are close to MRI in terms of LV function, LV wall assessment. You can look at valves. You can, I can tell you what's going on with the aortic valve. I can tell you what's going on with the mitral valve. And as our technology improves, our delineation of these valves becomes even better as well. We can also look at myocardial assessment. What's happening with the myocardium? Here you can see an LV aneurysm with a big thrombus with a calcified rim. Um, we can also tell you if there's a big pericardial effusion causing the patient's chest pain or shortness of breath. I can tell you if there's no plaque, what is going on with the coronaries? Are there coronary aneurysms? Does this patient previously have Kawasaki's disease or another inflammatory uh, systemic disorder that caused coronary aneurysms and different, different problems with the patient's presentation? Is there myocardial bridging? Is that why there's chest symptoms going on here? We can tell you all of this with the CCTA. And even outside the heart, we can tell you if there's an aortic dissection. I'll immediately send it to, uh, to, to Alan Braverman to, to evaluate, but I, I can be more confident that their chest pain is not from coronary disease, but from some, maybe a Marfan syndrome. Do they have pulmonary emboli that are causing chest pain? Do they have significant esophagitis? I get so happy when they come in and see me and they have esophagitis and hiatal hernias rather than coronary disease. I quickly ship them back to you guys or my GI colleagues to help out. But I can be very confident they don't need stress testing. They don't need further ischemic evaluation because they don't have any coronary disease. Um, no talk on CCTA is complete without talking about the Scott Hart trial. This is a prospective trial, open label, parallel group, randomized trial, looking at 4,000 patients, getting standard of care plus CCTA as an initial strategy versus standard of care alone, including all the things that we already do with stress testing. And it's one of the only trials looking at non-invasive modalities that shows an outcomes benefit, a death from cardiovascular um, heart disease or non-fatal MI uh, outcome difference using a CCTA strategy first. 
um, also non-fatal MI significant difference using CCTA first. Now, a CCTA doesn't cure your plaque. And, it, and if you look more deeply into the data, there's no statistical significant difference in rates of CAT, no statistical significant difference in rates of PCI, but what there was was a significant difference in rates of preventative therapy being adhered to. And so when patients come to see me, and I show them these pictures of their arteries, it's very different than telling them that they're five to 20% on the ACFD full cord equation. I can look at them and say, you have this plaque, and I can tell you that it might rupture, and that you really need to be on that statin. So let's, let's work on your myalgias, and let's work on your, you know, your reticence, and let's really prevent, this, prevent your events. And so all this data has been amassing over the decades, and now both sides of the ocean agree that CCTA is, should be supported uh, as a tool to assess patients' risk. This is the 2019 ESC guidelines showing that you know, the Krebs cycle of looking at patients' uh, risk includes coronary CTA uh, for low to intermediate risk patients. If they're high risk, maybe turn to, an, to a um, non-invasive imaging modality that really answers the question of ischemia. Uh, if you look at this uh, figure. I think it's really representative. This is how I think when I'm looking at a patient. If they're low intermediate risk, maybe they don't need any testing, but if they do, I, I, t I tend to uh, focus on CCTA at the low intermediate risk. And if they're really high risk, if they're 85 years old, I can see calcium on other CT scans, and they have all the right uh, underpinnings for very high risk of coronary disease, then I'm just going to go straight for cath, or I'm going to get a, a tool that will tell me what am I going to do in the cath lab when I get there, like a PET or a SPECT. The 2021 American guidelines, uh, instead of depicting it in a circle, depict it in a triangle. And you can see that they're asymptomatic or low risk. Maybe they don't need any testing, and that's supported by data. And if they're intermediate risk, if you're going to do any anatomic or functional testing, consider coronary CTA or any of the other stress imaging modalities I've mentioned. And if they're super high risk, maybe they go straight to the cath lab, where we can do invasive assessment. This is a busy slide, but I just want to visually depict that coronary CTA is right alongside all the other stress testing modalities with now a class 1 indication. It used to be 2A, 2B. And you can use FFRCT with a 2A recommendation if you have an intermediate lesion where you're wondering about the ischemic potential of that lesion. This is for acute chest pain with intermediate risk. If they have known prior testing, but the prior testing was inconclusive or mildly abnormal more than um, less than a year ago, then you can consider CTA with a 2A indication and FFRCT as well. What about the stable uh, chest pain population with no known coronary disease? Well, that gets a class one indication if they end up falling in that intermediate risk that I told you about before. If they're low risk, maybe they don't need anything. If they're high risk, maybe they go straight to other imaging modalities. Um, if you're gonna take away anything about how to incorporate all the data I've told you and how to incorporate into your practice in the clinic, I would take this one away. If you're intermediate or high risk and you're young, those are ideal patients for CCTA. We're more likely to get diagnostic images, good quality images, and images that will help change your management. If they're, and if, what this also assumes is that you have um, a high quality imaging and expert interpretation center like we do here, and we're very lucky to have that. Um, and it also assumes that the question here is to rule out disease or detect non-obstructive disease that you can act on in, in the clinic. If you have older patients and, you're, and your decision making is really driven by how much ischemia they're having, identifying ischemia as a driver of therapy, then maybe you should do non-coronary uh, CT imaging. And I have to, you know, it sounds like the best thing since sliced bread, but there are reasons not to do a CCTA, um, and we have to talk about them. If they're allergic to iodine, then you don't, you don't want to get a CT. If they have heart rate variability and arrhythmias, it can make a huge difference in the quality of your data set. And the left-hand side, you can see a patient with poor heart rate control, and the right-hand side, you can see someone with excellent heart rate control, and it's night and day. Uh, inability to cooperate with breath holds. If, if they have dementia, if they're, if they're not able to follow commands, then maybe that's not the patient that gets a CTA. If they're having an acute MI, then maybe they need to see our colleagues in the cath lab rather than ourselves in the imaging lab to see what, what's going on. If they're decompensated heart failure, severely hypotensive and hemodynamically unstable, not the best patient to be sending to the CT lab. If they have renal impairment, defined as what we, whatever we define in our local uh, protocols, you should probably not get a CCTA because of the iodine needs. Um, and then if they have contraindications to heart rate control agents like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or even ivabradine, um, that prevents us from controlling their heart rate, maybe we shouldn't be getting this. Um, and if they can't get nitroglycerin, I, I'm a huge believer in nitroglycerin as, as a critical part of the protocol because arteries get bigger, way bigger with nitroglycerin, and you can see much more inside of them if they're bigger tubes. And so I would argue, and you, you need this for FFRCT analysis, so if you can't give nitroglycerin for whatever reason, maybe you shouldn't be getting a CT. But things are changing. Uh, technology's uh, evolving rapidly. We have a brand new scanner, uh, and uh, with the leadership of Dr. Woodard, we're getting even more of these new scanners called the photon counting scanner. And this will give us a better ability to look at smaller structures, look inside stents, and better characterize plaque. There's different um, uh, 
ways that we can exclude calcium, exclude uh, iodine, and do different spectral imaging that will allow us to look inside the plaque in ways that we weren't able to do with our traditional CT scanners. And um, I'll, I'll get into this in a second. That, that's exactly what uh, we're, we're looking into right now with the new scanner. Additionally, to help our, our colleagues in the cath lab, we can model what's going to happen before and after a PCI. So we can place a virtual stent inside a vessel and tell you what the FFRCT is before that stent and what's, what it's going to do to FFRCT after that stent is placed. This is under research development with HeartFlow and will be available soon. And that just speaks to all the different industry partners that are um, heavily invested in this space. Everything in medicine is being powered by AI, and CT is no different. We have clearly Elucid, HeartFlow, all working on ways to do everything that I just showed you for this last hour in a semi-automated fashion, to send them their CT data set through a cloud. They do all the analysis, plaque analysis, ischemia analysis, hemodynamic analysis, and they send you back a report in, within five minutes. Um, uh, and as, as scary as that is uh, to think that AI will replace the, all that analysis and all the hard work that we do, it's definitely necessary. As CT takes off, as volumes go up, there's no way we can do 50 scan analyses, give you all that information just presented in a reasonable uh, fashion with, with the workforce that we have. Um, so what, are, what am I doing? What are we doing? Um, I'm lucky enough to be at an institution where, where we get a lot of support, both from administration, faculty, and even the mentors in medicines. I'm working with Dr. Eric Ho. And, using the new scanner that we have, and a, a study that we've called the Photon Study, to look at plaque characterization with the brand new scanner I just told you about, comparing to conventional CT and to OCT imaging in the cath lab. And we're hoping to show that patients that are identified to have moderate lesions, that have moderate plaque, um, how the new scanner performs against traditional ways of looking at this um, will be quantified in terms of uh, plaque area assessment, plaque characteristics compared to what the invasive gold standard is of OCT. So how do we put this all together? As we near the end of the hour, um, I really think that coronary imagers are actually vascular biologists. You know, every time I look at a coronary CT data set or a patient, I'm thinking about what's happening in their coronaries. Where are they on that atherosclerotic cascade? And I think that the, I, I didn't go into this, but the ischemia trial, Courage, uh, Fame, Barry 2D, et cetera, I think what we've learned for the stable population, treating ischemia makes people feel better, whether that's medical therapy or whether it's PCI, we can have another hour discussion about that. But I think treating ischemia makes people feel better. But I think halting the atherogenesis and plaque progression will actually end up saving lives, will decrease the rates of plaque rupture, decrease the rates of ACS and sudden cardiac death. And I think that we need to leverage our best imaging modalities to study this. And that isn't just coronary CTA, it includes everything that we have at our arsenal. And we're uniquely positioned to address this question. We have experts and leaders and, and um, um, in, in every field, whether it's imaging, lipids, vascular medicine, cardiac genomics, cardiac immunology, and we have the infrastructure with the CCIR and the Institute of Clinical and Translational Research to make this happen. And so if you were to ask me which trial would change clinical practice the most after having told you everything about what we can do to predict risk, what do I want to see that will change how I treat patients and what I want to do going forward? Well, what I want to do is I, want to, I only want to image and take care and focus in on patients that are high risk based on the most contemporary clinical risk scores beyond ASCVD. Uh, I want, I want them to all undergo CCTA with the newest tools that have decreased radiation uh, requirements, decreased contrast requirements, apply the plaque analysis tools that we have to identify which plaques will rupture, which ones will not, apply the computational fluid dynamics to identify which ones are ischemic, which ones have too much shear stress that portend risk, exclude the ones that have no plaque, exclude the ones that have left main or surgical disease, and randomize them to elevated risk, or, or separate them to elevated risk based on whatever vulnerability score that we de derive from our CT clinical uh, parameters versus low risk. And within that elevated risk, really hone in on the patients that you think are gonna come in with the ACS event within the next two years and randomize them to preemptive PCI or medical therapy. I know that this is probably giving people a lot of uh, anxiety as we talk about non-obstructive lesions and PCI, but I think we need to answer this question because we need to know what therapy is gonna modulate their risk of having a plaque rupture event. And, this does, and then we can follow their primary endpoint with the MACE event at 12 years, and we can look at their secondary outcomes as well. I think this would be an incredibly impactful trial that would change management, change how confident I am about what to do in the cath lab, what to do at the clinic. And it doesn't just have to be PCI. We can randomize into drug-coated balloons. Perhaps we coat these balloons with agents that decrease atherogenesis and stabilize plaques. And perhaps it's PCI against maximal antiplatelet therapy. We, have, we just had discussions in our journal club in cardiology about uh, monotherapy with secondary prevention, aspirin, plavix, ticagrelor, et cetera, which ones are best at decreasing events. Perhaps if we focus just in on the highest risk patients that will rupture, 
we'll get a better sense of the absolute risk reduction of different antiplatelet strategies. And maybe it's advanced lipid therapies, maybe it's inclusoran, bepidoic acid, PCSK9s, Vasipa, or a combination of all of the above. We can design a trial that uses imaging to hone in on the patients that will have the highest risk. Maybe it's immune therapy. We talk about colchicine for pre secondary prevention. We talk about canakinumab, methotrexate, the anti-inflammatory properties of statins. Maybe the immune therapy angle is what we need to go after. And as I showed you, we can model immune um, inflammation uh, with CCTA data sets. Maybe it's gene therapy. You know, CRISPR technology is taking off. Um, Verve is a company that works on uh, knocking out PCSK9 um, uh, genes. Maybe there's genetic therapy that we can, uh, that we can study uh, for patients who have the highest risk of having these events. And so in summary, I think what I hope you take away from this talk is that CCTA can effectively rule out disease. It can identify atherosclerotic, atherosclerosis early. It can track disease progression. It can identify plaque vulnerability. And it can, with its hemodynamics, it can identify lesions that may benefit from coronary interventions. And maybe the next time um, that I'm here, uh, we'll have done the trials that I just outlined to you, and I'll be speaking to you about those results. And I want to thank all the support I get from the Department of Medicine, Cardiovascular Division, from the, from Mallinckrodt, and my fledgling growing research team that includes our internal medicine residents. So thanks for your attention. I'll take any questions. That was a terrific talk. Thanks so much. We have time for a few questions. Yeah. Pam. Excellent question. So, so for those of you in the recording that didn't hear the question, uh, Dr. Pam Woodard asked um, whether or not hemodynamic assessment with shear wall stress and axial plaque stress can be incorporated into our analysis in a routine clinical basis, and how will that impact uh, uh, outcomes and management? I think, so th that's actually proprietary for HeartFlow. Emerald is sponsored by HeartFlow. Emerald 2, which we were a part of in my prior institution, we, we, we um, supply data sets to them to validate it in a much bigger cohort. Uh, uh, I think it will be a huge part of our assessment. You know, we don't just look at diameter stenosis. I think that's now, with all the data that we have from CT imaging, it's just a very simplistic view of risk. We have to incorporate all these different parameters. And as we do that, as these tools become more available outside of HeartFlow, with Siemens, with GE, with Philips, in the scanner, or with other, uh, other um, vendors in the space, I think this will only enhance our ability to predict risk and only make CT stand out even brighter amongst all the other Im non-invasive Im imaging modalities in predicting patients' risk rupture. And I think it, it needs to be incorporated in our research uh, uh, trials because I think that one of the big issues that we have with prevention trials is that the event rates are so low. If you look at Scott Hart, the ACS rate, the MACE rates were so low. And if we enrich our patient populations in these trials with patients that actually have risk that we know we can correlate to outcomes, and only study those with the different interventions that we have. Maybe the deltas and absolute risk reductions will be a lot bigger, and we can be more confident that our therapies maybe don't need to be done on everybody. Maybe not everyone needs a CTTA, which was a big premise of the PRECISE trial. And maybe patients that have really high risk don't need to be wasting time with a CTTA. They need to go straight to the cath lab for a coronary physiologist to take care of. Thanks. I just want to say we're very, very lucky to have you here at Washington. Thank, thank you so much. Fred?
Fred, what I'm hearing from you is that you want to engage in a research project where we look at the new scanners with their excellent test characteristics and a answer that question. Um, the, 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 and I'd be happy to take you up on that, and we can work together on that. But really, to answer your question, this has been looked at with their traditional scanners. And really, what it comes down to, there's a lot of data here. Some centers do it really, really well, and they have excellent protocols that work for their patient population. Certain patient populations aren't catered to that. If you have a very obese, difficult to control with heart rate um, uh, patient population that walks into your ED, that's going to be very different than if you're at West County uh, or a different area of the, of, the, of the country where the demographics are different. And you can, you can control a lot of the different patient parameters better. Um, maybe the scanners are even better at different places. So it's really hard to make a general statement. But triple rule outs, there's some data from some centers where it's excellent, has excellent uh, test characteristics where you can simultaneously rule out dissection, PE, and coronary disease in one scan. But there are centers where there's trade offs. It's excellent for the coronaries, but it's lousy for the aorta. It's excellent for the aorta, but it's lousy for the, for the pulmonary arteries because they're different parts of the heart that get different amounts of contrast. You have to time your, uh, your acquisition and your bolus strategy to optimize for both right and left side of pacification. So there's a lot of nuance there. Newer scanners, less reliance on high uh, contrast loads, uh, better performance with high, fast heart rates. It's only going to make those triple routes more reliable. And we do see that all the time. We see PEs all the time, aortic dissections all the time, and other pathologies all the time when we get CCTAs. And you know th that's only the cardiac uh, structures. You see pulmonary pathology, esophageal pathology all the time that can help you hone in on what the chest pain is coming from, where the, where the chest pain is coming from. Yeah, the question was, um, how do we incorporate inflammation with uh, FAI, with the fat attenuation index? I did include that in one of the earlier slides. It's not available if you order a CT today. It's actually in, in, in research. It's through a company called Caristo. You send it out to them. They send you back an FAI score. I'm very excited about that. You know, I'm all about prevention. When I'm seeing a patient, what they want to do is they don't want to wait until they have an ASCVD event. They want to start therapies as soon as they, they can with the confidence of knowing that they have high risk. And I think there, it's a burgeoning field. Um, there's some mixed data comparing FAI scores to other markers that we use in the clinic with high sensitivity CRP, but I think that the data is only going to get better as the scanners get better and as our understanding of where the thresholds are for abnormal and normal uh, change and how we understand vascular biology, which is why I said we're all, gonna, we're all becoming vascular biologists. We need to understand what's happening with inflammation. You know, maybe today you're inflamed and maybe a week from now you're not. And maybe it has to do with your diet. And maybe it has to do with what medicines you're taking. And that number is not a fixed number. It's a fluid number. And so identifying that with serial imaging is going to be key. I think it's a huge and vastly interesting space. And actually, I'm going to meet with Dr. Zayad in vascular surgery because he's looking at different blood markers. And I want to marry that to FAI imaging to see if we can get a story that both is corroborated by biomarkers, the, uh, you know, the basic science lab, and also the imaging side, and see if we can identify risk in a multifaceted way. Thank you very much. Okay.